kid, we, as I mentioned, we're all predisposition in some sort of way, unless we live, you know, in the, the mountains on an organic farm and we're not, you know, we're not susceptible to anything, but we're not, you know, I mean, if it's the water we're drinking, the foods we're eating, whatever that may be, if it's in the air, uh, a pandemic, all of these things that we are basically now not resilient. So we have to make sure that we're resilient. But yeah, it's again, to assure that, you know, we are properly detoxifying. We're probably releasing what we should, you know, to get rid of those things that are, uh, you know, detrimental for us, if not now, uh, in the long term. You know, I personally had, you know, things that I, you know, was, was challenged with as far as, you know, gut dysbiosis and things like that. And even though it may just be in the gut or it may just be something that is, you know, a little bit uncomfortable, that could also now lead to something downstream because now I can't detoxify. Hello and welcome to the Wellness Trinity Podcast, where we interview top holistic experts and bring you natural solutions for modern day wellness. Let's get started with your host, Dr. Jacqueline. Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining the Wellness Training Podcast. I'm Dr. Jacqueline from thewellnesstraining.com, where we provide natural solutions for modern day wellness. Today, we're going to discuss on our Women's Health Series, Understanding Female-Related Cancers with Michael Reed, IFOC, from healthasmeanttobe.com. Just a little disclaimer before we get started, what we discuss in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. What you do with the information is to be used at your discretion as the recommendations are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Are you having a hard time conceiving? Are you concerned about raising healthy children? Would you like to age gracefully? These are all concerns that many women have. And in order to have healthy pregnancies in children and age gracefully with youthful skin, vibrant wellness, and incredible joints, we need to thoroughly cleanse the body in this day and age because there are more than 85,000 chemicals that are just plaguing the earth. And these chemicals cause a whole slew of problems. And a lot of it is related to the backup in the liver that causes diminished hormone production. Our protocols at the Wellness Trinity systematically removes layers of infections and toxins, thus fully cleansing the body. It gets you back to homeostasis where your body is happiest and healthiest when done correctly. I am happy to be on this protocol and I'm actually waiting to get pregnant because I want myself and my husband to be thoroughly cleansed before I even think of having a baby. And I don't fear growing old and falling apart because I know that if my body is at homeostasis, it's going to be just fine. I was told I look 10 years younger in my new headshot, so this stuff works. Check out the link in the show notes to schedule your free 15-minute consultation to discover if we are a good fit to work together. And if so, I will help you get to the root of your health challenges. So I met Michael Reed a few months ago, actually, on LinkedIn, and you know, some people you just click with, and I knew that there was something that this guy was doing that was really special. And the more I got to know him, the more I realized that this guy was working with a lot of clients with cancer. And so naturally, as my Women's Health podcast series unfolded, I thought, hmm, I wonder if Michael Reed understands how female cancers work. And sure enough, he is starting to specialize in that area. So, or has already been, I'll let him explain it once we welcome him to the show. But before that, I wanted to just say a little uh, bio for him. Michael Reed is a functional medicine oncology coach, AADP, and certified integrative health coach and founder of Health as Meant to Be with a love of restless curiosity for functional medicine and how it looks at the many angles that can be be taken to support the entire body in feeling better and with the possibility of even reversing itself from the symptoms of the dis-ease. And despite his hiding from it, he has allowed himself the vulnerability with embracing this gift of deep connection with cancer between the struggles in our lives, ability to deal with the daily crises and stressors of the world that surround us and the negative messages we send to our bodies, mind, and spirit. Michael Reed, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Jacqueline. Thank you very much. 
So, you know, it's been a huge honor getting to know you. And, um, you know, it's amazing how even through just conversating on the internet, I could just feel your energy. I, it's like I feel sparkles when I, <laughs> when I talk to you. You have this, I don't know, you have this special <laughs> gift uh, with you that just radiates even through the internet. It's amazing. No, thank you. And like you had mentioned, it's, uh, it's something I, I, I sort of ran from <laughs> for many years. Uh, I, you know, it's, I've, I've been connected to uh, the disease of cancer for just, you know, most of my life. Uh, you know, I kind of, just to kind of share, uh, you know, uh, a story, even going all the way back to middle school. Uh, you know, I was, happened to be going through my, my yearbook and I had, uh, came across my middle school yearbook and I noticed rather than my name, uh, as far as, you know, fellow students who had signed it, they signed it with Mr. Advice. And it said things like, Michael, thank you for being there with, uh, my homework, <laughs> Michael, thank you for the, you know, it, it, the, the struggles that, you know, kids go through, but it was very meaningful for them. So when I look back at that, I, you know, there was no name for the work that I do, but I was always, if it was family, friends, and that was really the, the kind of fearful part that started to show up in my life. And that were friends that were stricken with cancer, um, you know, family members, and uh, I didn't quite understand it. And you know, later on, after uh, you know, uh, you know, my, you know, starting my practice, you know, uh, nearly a decade ago, and starting to work with uh, what I thought would be helping people eat more salads or eat healthier, what started to show up were people that were really struggling with uh, with cancer. And mm -hmm. uh, but my just kind of connection to that, and uh, really being you know present and you know seeing the the differences of those who were in uh, either went into remission or those who, uh, who passed on. But, uh, you know, there was definitely uh, something that, that resonated for me and really allowed me to, to show up to my practice and to show up to this work and to finally be more vulnerable and accept this and, uh, and be okay with it. Mm -hmm. So what, why do you think that you were fearful to, it, it was like God was calling you almost and yes. you're like, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. what, what was the, the fear factor exactly in that? What it was, you know, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I play collegiate sports and I'm like, you know, so I would, I said, no, I'm going to work with athletes. I'm going to, you know, it was, I think the biggest fear, and that's a great question is that, uh, you know, I started to maybe, uh, you know, wonder why me or wonder why I was being put in this position of, you know, being surrounded by what was my deep connection to it. Um, you know, was I going to develop cancer? Uh, mm. But it was really that connection I had with it. And it was fearful because I can, I, when I'm working with someone, I can fear their, their trauma. I can fear mm. that fear. I can feel, I really can feel the disease. Um, mm -hmm. and so it really puts me at, uh, you know, I think as well, because, you know, it, I wanted to help people. I wanted to help others. And when I think the fear part is when I, you know, a few people that I work with, you know, pass on mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, am I doing the right thing? Is this, you know, am I, you know, why, you know, why weren't they able to overcome? But I had a, a client who who told me she was basically like, you know, she basically said, Michael. And I said, well, am I doing the right thing? Am I, you're not in remission, you know, you're at a, you know, really, you know, bad place. And, um, you know, she was at UCLA and she said, you know, Michael, she says, you got to understand, I should have been gone years ago. And that really resonated for me, you know, when she said that, she said, it's, you know, the work that you're doing, she said, just you being here and the, uh, you know, that support and that connection, she said, you know, it's okay. She, she felt she was in a better place, but she felt that she should, have, you know, she lived another two, three years, um, you know, with the work that I was doing with her. So that really, mm -hmm. again, allowed me to be less fearful mm -hmm. and allowed me to be more vulnerable. And mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of strength in that when I'm working with someone that is in deep pain and, and, you know, really struggling and looking for answers. And, uh, not necessarily if it's living with cancer or if it's remission in cancer, but living with that trauma or the diagnosis and what's next. Yeah. You know, even as much as I think I wouldn't be too scared if I, I was diagnosed with that, you know, it's where there's so much stigma about around the word cancer. 
that is frightening that even I think I might be scared a little bit. As much as I know all this holistic stuff, as much as I've heard of people recovering, et cetera. So for people that don't even understand the, the, the answers that me and you might have or other people in the holistic field, uh, I can't even imagine how scary that is when someone gets that diagnosis. Exactly. Especially what you just mentioned about being frightening. Uh, I hear, I hear words such as I just spoke with someone last weekend and uh, you know, they were that feeling of loneliness, that feeling of being alone, um, despite their strength and despite their, uh, you know, their career. Uh, it's a, you know, that feeling of not being vulnerable, you know, being vulnerable now uh, mm. to not know what's next and to have that support system. And uh, it's, you know, it's lacking, unfortunately, because it's when someone is diagnosed, it's the entire family mm-hmm. that's diagnosed. It's, yeah. you know, uh, it's the mother, it's the daughter, it's everyone, the, the kids, it's everyone that's, you know, the grandparents, everyone's diagnosed. But some, you know, in, you know uh, unfortunately, many circumstances often, and, you know, 99% of my clients are women. And, you know, I think one of the things that they tell me is that, you know, they feel like they've always taken care of others. They've always mm. been there as that support system. And when they're now left feeling vulnerable and not knowing what's next, there's a, again, a lot of uh, emotional pain of not being able to be there for everyone and to, you know, to be motherly and to be, you know, uh, a daughter and to kind of be that support system. And now they need that support. I mm-hmm. think that's why uh, most of my clients are women is that uh, I have that connection to that and be able to understand, uh, you know, what they're really dealing with. Mm. Well, that's an interesting note that you make about how women that you work with tend to be the ones giving and giving and giving. Mm-hmm. I think that as a woman, it's almost like we think that we have to give everything away and not take care of ourselves almost. And that, right. is that what you see? Yes, exactly. It's like, you know, uh, I like to say it's like, you know, is your cup full? You know, are you just, you know, make sure your cup is full, that kind of, you know, that radical self-care, you know, that, you know, it's really important. I find that, you know, often women, you know, they're, it's, they're being very supportive, but their cup is half full. Right. So it's like, no, fill your cup. It's okay to, you know, I like, I like the term, it's okay to not be okay. You know, Mm -hmm. it's okay to be dealing with this. And, uh, you know, it's okay to now, you know, uh, change that thought to change those thoughts. Because that's, you know, one of the things I see often as well is, you know, those who have changed, you know, again, those messages you send to yourself, you know, but yet they were given a terminal diagnosis, three weeks to live, you know, oh, there's no way, you know, three, four weeks, you know, make arrangements. So it's, it's great to see that when, you know, they can say, no, I, you know, I'm going to, you know, take care of me. I'm going to, you know, uh, you know, this is, this is for me. And they really make a a change and they're very, you know, positive about the outcome, you know, uh, and it's just amazing to see someone that is in remission after given a diagnosis of three to four weeks. It's, you know, it's, uh, for me, it's very rewarding. It's another reminder. Again, whenever I have tried to either stray from this work or either uh, maybe find a different direction, like you said, God, the universe really kind of throws a brick at me. And it's, (laughs) it's someone that shows up out of nowhere. It doesn't matter the, you know, it could be in an elevator. It could be, you know, just walking down the street. It doesn't matter. Some, someone will literally show up right in front of me. Uh, and, uh, you know, and they'll say they just received a diagnosis. So. Mm. But, uh, it just happened last weekend. I was just, you know, having dinner with a friend and, uh, their, uh, spouse, you know, was just diagnosed. So again, it just, you know, we all, again, we were able to kind of laugh about it and, and joke about it, but I realized this is a calling and this is uh, something that I can't escape from. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's hard to e- escape from something that it's just imprinted on our DNA almost. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I knew if I didn't follow in this direction too, I would not be very happy. <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't easy. I'm sure it wasn't easy to get to where you're at either. But at the same time, it's the rewards are are so it's just so amazing to see people be able to have answers that when, when they get that diagnosis, 
and to know that you might have a potential solution for them that can either extend their life or um, add value to their life. So they, you know, the, the idea is we don't necessarily know when we're going to die. Right. But at right. the same time, um, why not live a quality of life? So I mean, yeah. <laughs> and then who knows, maybe, maybe we can reverse the thing. So exactly. there's so many ways to look at this. And, um, you know, for those of you listeners that don't know, my dad died of cancer. So this is near and dear to my heart. And that's a big reason why I think me and Michael connected at first was because he's, he's dealing with that, you know, that group of people. And so, so for me, it just was like, it, it just, it struck a chord real, real big because people need those answers. It's not easy. The, fa the family, like you said, is all affected. Um, and uh, a lot of times people think it's over and it, I don't think that has to be true after what I've learned. And I'm sure you, you see the same thing. <laughs> exactly. And that's, you know, uh, a great point. I, one of the things I always say is I'm not trying to avoid the inevitable. Uh, I think, you know, we all are, you know, we're all, we're all going to die. And, uh, but, and I think that was an, in this journey, as you mentioned, uh, and working with those, uh, you know, those who have, who are on that, that next step and who may not survive their diagnosis or their cancer is, you know, again, having, you know, to the realization that it's not about avoiding the inevitable, but it's about, you know, uh, you know, having comfort and having, uh, being able to still thrive living with cancer, being able to still, you know, after post-oncology treatment, being able to still do the things that they love. And when, if, you know, when that day comes, they're, they're okay with it because they still were allowed to experience, you know, the things in life that they wanted to experience as opposed to being in a state of, you know, waiting to die or waiting to just kind of, you know, till that, till that day. So it's, it's, it's also rewarding to still, still see them be able to travel and do the things that, you know, someone told them they couldn't walk or, you know, to do the things that they still love to do. Uh, and, you know, just again with, uh, and be okay with their diagnosis. You know, I, one of the things I, I, I like to say is um, I don't, you know, it's, it's not so much about their diagnosis. It's really, I want to focus on them, you know, uh, and the, the entire person, not, you know, their diagnosis isn't, you know, is important, but it's not, it's not everything. So it's being able to, so they can move forward beyond the, the diagnosis. Yeah. Well, and that's a good point. We are not a diagnosis. Uh, I mean, I don't, I can't even diagnose myself. I just look at root causes and it sounds like that's probably what you're doing too, is, is looking for the root cause of why it's even there in the first place. Um, so I think sometimes it can be nice to have a diagnosis, um, you know, especially if you're just like, I don't know what, what's going mm -hmm. on, but, um, I mean, when we're doing this type of work, it's like, it's almost irrelevant in some ways, just because now we can, we're looking at why the problem is there. I shouldn't say it's quite irrelevant. It's just not as almost as important as looking deeper beyond the surface. So, um, sure. You are not your diagnosis. Whoever's listening <laughs> to this, you're, that's the point and my, what I, I'm all my rambling. You're not your diagnosis. And, um, I forgot what I was going to say, but I, I wanted to uh, go back to that idea of feeling guilty. Like, why do you think that women feel guilty for taking care of themselves? I think, uh, you know, I, I just spoke with someone over the weekend, uh, a new client. And, uh, when I do ask them that question, because it's, you know, they'll, they'll tend to tell me that, you know, it's the way they grew up. It's what they learned, uh, you know, from their mother, passed on from their grandparents. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, uh, you know, it's just engraved in them, uh, you know, to where they feel that they need to be the role model. They need to be supportive. And it's a very, you know, it's something they've always thought about. They wanted that in their lives with their families. They wanted to be there. So when they feel like they're now, you know, taking care of themselves, I call it radical self-care. Um, but it's when it, it's like they feel they're almost being selfish in a way, mm -hmm. uh, or that uh, they're not, uh, you know, that they need to give more. But one of the, the kind of analogies I like to use is is a cup. You know, your cup's overflowing. Mm -hmm. So that's good. If it's overflowing, absolutely, you should you can continue to give and to to. Give that love and support uh but if it's empty 
there's, you know, there's, we can only do so much. And that's, again, where I feel and we see often in those, when your cup is not full, and then that's what, you know, kind of looking downstream like we do in functional medicine is where disease can show up, mm-hmm. you know, because again, our body is not full, you know, we're running on, you know, it's empty. So we need to have those things, you know, we have, it's good to be overflowing and then we can be more resilient Mm -hmm. to, you know, to disease and to, you know, to cancer and to, you know, to, you know, to be able to thrive in life. Mm -hmm. But I feel that when, you know, uh, again, those mind, that mind body connection, those messages that we're sending ourselves and when our body is at a state of disease, if we're not, you know, resilient, we're not able to kind of, you know, fight those things off and to, you know, to be able to move beyond, uh, you know, again, before we're diagnosed, uh, mm-hmm. as opposed to waiting until we're diagnosed, you know, to fill our cups. But that's one of the things I see, especially, uh, you know, in women. And it's great to see that, to be able to use that analogy. And they always say, wow, I never thought about mm-hmm. it that way. And, you know, it's like, I'm going to practice radical self-care. But again, it's making sure their cup is, 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 full and over, mm-hmm. you know, overflowing as opposed to, yeah. you know, those things of feeling insecure about it. But now it's, yeah. Yeah. It's a, and it, it almost feels like it's a new paradigm for women to shift their thinking um, mm-hmm. versus just in general. I think even men probably get this too. It's like, we're running ourselves ragged in society, trying to keep up with the Joneses. And now we have all this coronavirus stuff and it's just one thing after another. And where a lot of us are just trying to survive um, so it can be very hard to make that time for ourselves and exercise and eat healthy and all that. Sometimes I'm on a roll and I'm juicing every day and I'm mo- growing my microgreens. And, and at this point I was like, I just need to take a step back. And luckily my husband, now he's stepping in and he's doing uh, his part and our microgreens look fabulous. And <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, you know, so sometimes we have to like, even as a woman, for me too, I, I feel the same way. I was like, I'm going to take care of my family, mm-hmm. which my family is me and my husband, but <laughs> right. yeah, I don't even have exactly. kids yet at this point. And I was feeling overwhelmed with trying to take on all these extra responsibilities. And I can't tell you how nice it feels right now that my husband's helping. And right. I think that that can be hard um, for a woman to ask their husband to help uh, them to, to do stuff. But in this day and age where a lot of women are, are working too, it's kind of like, you know, we need to share our responsibilities as well. And even stay at home moms, I know they have huge responsibilities as well too. So, um, sometimes we, I think we need to, we definitely need to take that guard down and, and say, Hey, you know, I need help. And maybe it's a friend, maybe it's someone at the church. So maybe it's someone in the community sometimes that we need to, um, even just chat with sometimes even just letting mm-hmm. out how we're feeling is, is a way of, of being able to stay balanced. <laughs> exactly. So. Yeah. No, I, you know, and, and it, you know, it's a good point you brought up because as men we're taught to basically, you know, Oh, there's no crying in baseball. You know, mm-hmm. uh, we're taught when I played sports, it's basically, you know, you know, coach, I think I just passed out. <laughs> I think, something's wrong and he's like how many fingers I have up you know and you're like okay two he's like get back out there that was how I grew up you know it was always kind of this well fine you deal with it (laughs) you know and we're taught to just kind of not be vulnerable we're taught these things and so it's one of the things that one you know as you mentioned I always tell my wife it's like make sure your cup is full because if you're not if it's not then I, I can't you know that it's not you know it's not good and you're right it's you know often I think you know, uh, you know, with something that just really, you know, we're, we're taught that, you know, we're taught to just, you know, to, you know, that we're okay. And it's one of the things, again, it's okay to not be okay. You Mm -hmm. know, it's okay to make sure your cup is full. So, but yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about breast cancer. Um, when I was at Hippocrates Health Institute, do you know about Hippocrates? Uh, I do. Okay. So, Hippocrates, for those of you that are listening that have never heard of this, Hippocrates Health Institute is a really big institute in Florida that a lot of people that have cancer go to and find solutions. It's, it's incredible. So I studied there for nine weeks in their health educator program. And before that, like I said, my dad had died of cancer when he was 38 and I was only nine years old. And my mom was widowed at 36 with three young children. I was the oldest. And then I um, my grandma's my mom's mom so both sides of my family so my mom's 
my grandma on my mom's side died when she was 58 of breast cancer. And so naturally, I, I didn't even realize I was carrying a burden, thinking that, oh, I'm just doomed to die of cancer, you know, with both these sides of my family dying at young ages. And so when I went to Hippocrates Health Institute, they said only 3% of breast cancer is inher inherited. And I can't tell you how much of a burden that lifted off of me. I, I had no idea even if it was, it was even carrying this or that I might have been fearful, et cetera. Um, obviously, when you're young and you have a parent that dies, um, you might be carrying all kinds of stuff you don't even realize you're carrying. So that's a whole different story in itself of the healing journey I had to go on with that. But um, like you said, the family carries it. I mean, I see it in my mom and the rest of my family as well, too. And so 3%, only 3% was inherited. What they said, the other part of it is the biggest part is the diet and the lifestyle um, and, uh, you know, obviously diet is huge, but lifestyle, I would include all the environmental toxins and everything else that is like, it's just so rampant how, what we're exposed to that's causing these issues. So hopefully someone that's listening mm -hmm. is having some relief hearing that because, um, we don't have to be doomed. I don't think we have to be doomed. Yeah. Like we mentioned that, um, you know, we, when our time is up, our time is up at the same time, there's just so many amazing solutions and I'm ready to pick your brain, Michael, and see what, what you have to say about all this. So let's start with this first. Um, so can someone get breast cancer if it does not run in their family? Yeah, no, and that's, you know, often brought up. You know, I always say, you know, we're all predispositioned in some sort of way, like you said, Dr. Rothman, if it's toxins, lifestyle medicine, you know, I like to call it lifestyle medicine. Uh, because lifestyle is a part of it, you know, it's, it's, it's everything. It's not just what we eat. It's, you know, uh, it's, it, you know, is it a bad relationship? You know, all of these things come into play. Uh, and, you know, to answer your question, it's again, right. You know, it's kind of a stigma where, you know, all of my, my family had it. So therefore I'm doomed, like you said, it's, you know, but again, it's, uh, you know, the percentage is so low and it, it's what we, the environment that we're creating for ourselves, you know, as I just mentioned, mm -hmm. the relationships, the, 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 you know, the, the, you know, what were the intake, the food, you know, uh, that we're, that we're eating. So there's so many different factors and, you know, yeah, it's, it's what, you know, what we're either turning on or turning off. So absolutely. If we're adopting, uh, you know, lifestyle habits that, you know, are detrimental, uh, you know, to the potential down, downstream of cancer, Absolutely, we can we can turn those like to say light switches. We can turn those genes on to where now we are a higher risk for breast cancer, higher risk for colon cancer, uh, you know, for for cancer in general. Uh, but it's that environment that we've created for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Or the opposite, we can again turn off those genes that uh, maybe you know pop again that percentage that could, you know be in our family. But we now can adopt, you know, uh, different habits. We can adopt a different environment for ourselves, you know, create better relationships, you know, make sure our cups are full. Um, you know, we can uh, make sure that we're eating, uh, you know, uh, non-toxic foods, uh, that we're, uh, you know, we're telling ourselves positive messages. You know, we're not, you know, 24-7 news, uh, breaking news headlines that are negative, and then we're now telling ourselves messages uh you know it's again the uh, important in the kind of you know the mind body so uh but no so that you can as you know as i as one of the things i see there's so many different factors as opposed to one factor of uh you know of that our parents or that someone in our family has it there's so many other things so yeah absolutely you know it's it's one piece but it's a very small piece and a low percentage so no it, we don't have to have get cancer just because someone in our family has it. Mm. Don't all of us have cancer genes or cancer mm -hmm. in our body to a certain right. extent anyway? It's just whether we kind of flip the switch on or off. Exactly. Our cells, you know, we're always, you know, uh, you know, our cells are always, uh, you know, uh, moving and, you know, we have over, you know, a trillion cells are, that are sending messages to one another uh, that are communicating with other. It's, our bodies are always in a, some form of transition. Uh, you know, to developing uh, a tumor or not developing a tumor, but our, our bodies mm -hmm. are always in motion. Our cells are, you know, when you think about from a cellular point of view, 
yes, we all have some form of it, but it's again, the messages that we're sending to ourselves, you mm -hmm. know, the, those things that we're doing to our kind of global community within ourselves of cells <laughs> and mm -hmm. how they're reacting and what they're, the messages they're telling themselves. So again, that environment that we're creating within our body. So, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, so yeah, we all have some form of, but it's what we're, you know, the environment we're creating for. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know you like to talk a lot about the mind connection and obviously relationships are, are a huge part of our emotional health and what's mm -hmm. going on in our mental state. Um, do you think that negative emotions and bad relationships, do you think that the reason why they're not good for our body is it creates an acidic state in the body or do you, do you have a better explanation than that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's, it's all of the above. I think, you know, there's a major stress response uh, mm -hmm. to the body, you know, that uh, oxidative stress that it's, it's, you know, all of the things that we're now the body, you know, it does, it adapts. It's an amazing, you know, Thing that we've been blessed to have it really is we're not just a you know parts and that <laughs> you know uh it's so much you know from uh you know from our you know from our physical you know down to our muscles the the blood and down to the cells you know and then even the spiritual aspect you know so all of these things that are uh kind of whole and holistic uh you know when we're out of balance you know something like a bad relationship we're telling now ourselves that we're in a stressful environment. Mm -hmm. We're telling ourselves we're running from a lion or we're running from something. And mm -hmm. it's like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, you know, we're, you're in a bad state. I need to now maybe, uh, you know, hold on to the key nutrients, you know, uh, because, you know, I don't know what Michael's going through right now. He may be in a bad state. And so, again, I need to adapt to his environment right now because he's in a very stressful state. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, uh, I'm now dehydrated. I'm now, uh, I'm missing key nutrients. So all of these things can come mm -hmm. into play. As you can see, again, as we talk about so much in functional medicine and the entire approach of now downstream, we now can now be more higher risk, more susceptible to disease and cancer. Uh, you know, uh, in women, one of the things I see again are now, because of stress and that mess, those messages we are creating for ourselves is now we're already creating stress on the thyroid. Are we now in a stress mm -hmm. response? Is the thyroid not responding and, you know, creating now, which we see a lot in breast cancer is now, is there a, uh, you know, estrogen dominant state, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so many different factors that can come into play just from those messages. And again, that is affecting so much and not just one part of our body, but the entire body. So I, mm -hmm. it's, again, it's so important to really focus on uh, because one key factor is like a domino effects now affects so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the things I love about your approach is that you are looking at the whole picture. So uh, there's, you know, we talked a lot about the mental component. What about the physical components that you see? Um, we did mention that some of the dehydration can happen when people are stressed as well as nutrient deficiencies. Um, in general, people, you know, from the, like what we're doing to ourselves, where a lot of people are not necessarily drinking enough water or getting enough of the nutrients they need from their food. So I want to kind of expand since you do functional medicine. Um, I don't even know what type of labs and things like that, that you use, but I'm really kind of curious, uh, what labs that you use and then also, what, what are some common things that you find on those labs that people with breast cancer or any other type of female cancers have? Yeah, one of the things I see, and when I'm doing, especially with, um, I see a lot of the, the thyroid. So I think a lot of what happens in a lot of the, the tests, it's, well, you're okay. You know, there's certain markers where, you know, you're fine. And again, looking downstream, if someone has now a slow thyroid, slow everything, or fast thyroid, fast everything, mm -hmm. there's an imbalance. Mm -hmm. So now that imbalance is now, you know, creating further. And again, you see a lot, and there's more studies about that, about the, you know, the dominance of estrogen and things like that in breast cancer or, you know, ovarian cancer, certain, you know, uh, you know, things that I see are a lack of vitamin D, uh, you know, if it's sometimes if someone's, uh, you know, now not 
in a state where they're not moving. There's no movement, no exercise. So there's, again, uh, you know, maybe a lack of also key nutrients of vitamin D as well. So, uh, but I think a common denominator I see vitamin D, I see a lot of thyroid imbalance. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's, it depends on each unique situation. Um, there's times where I'm looking at someone's labs and again, you, you can see the deficiency, but, um, if I'm talking to someone and they're, we're talking from a, you know, the data, we're literally looking at the lab and in that conversation, um, I hear, well, is there, a you know, something, uh, you know, that's affecting me mentally and when, you know, whatever that is. And it's like, well, because my spouse has left me. Mm. I sometimes will literally push everything aside for a moment and concentrate on that because then I'm looking at a stress response. And um, that's where I, it's sometimes where the entire hours conversation, there's a lot of tears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, it's where that had to be pushed aside um, for a moment. So again, it's, it's, if it's, you know, something that's uh, emotionally related, it, it depends on the situation. Cause sometimes I'm like, Oh, I can see it here in your labs. It's definitely a deficiency. Let's concentrate on your, uh, you know, your thyroid or let's, you know, really focus on these uh, suggestions, mm -hmm. but often it's not always, um, you know, as opposed to lumping everybody into kind of one category it's not always the case but often right. i see a deficiency in a thyroid imbalance for sure mm -hmm. so why do you think aside from mental and emotional challenges why do you think that thyroid challenges are so common nowadays yeah i think um you know one of the things you know again i, I see a lot of toxins you know uh, you know where you know from what if it's a lot of processed foods, if it's a lot of, uh, you know, things, it could be, you know, again, the, the air. So, you know, if it's mold, uh, you know, it's just, you know, depending on their work environment as well, if they're in a state that they're, in, you know, bringing in and intaking kind of the, a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, toxins, it affects everything, it affects the liver. So those things that are necessary for the thyroid to, you know, to function optimally, it now can't do its job. And then when someone goes in, you know, to get a, uh, you know, the necessary lab work and someone says that, oh, you're fine, you're okay. As opposed to maybe again, taking the approach of maybe looking downstream and realizing they may be at a higher risk for something else and really focusing on those things as opposed to, you know, you're fine, it's, it's okay, it's your, your normal uh, as opposed to optimal. And sometimes they need to be optimal. Again, every person is unique. They may need to be at more of an optimal state to really get their, their thyroid function properly or, uh, you know, whatever that may be. If it's lifestyle, if it's uh, nutrient deficiency, if it's magnesium, whatever that may be, to get that, them in an optimal state to be able to now, again, slow thyroid, slow everything, uh, you know, so to, you know, to get their thyroid, you know, operating, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Perfect. So what about the yeah. estrogen dominance? Mm -hmm. I would, there's a connection between the thyroid and that, right? Yeah, you do see that in a lot of the case studies now. Uh, there's more talk about that, especially, you know, uh, and then someone, you know, again, they may, uh, you know, it's, if it's treat, you know, you see the, uh, you know, the hormone treatments as well to get them at a better state. Uh, I always feel, it, again, depends on each unique person. Uh, most of my clients, it's usually post chemo uh, treatment, whatever that may be. But yeah, you will see where there's more case studies of there's a dominance there, uh, you know, more in the, uh, the breast cancer. So with that dominance, again, imbalance, you know, as opposed to balance, you know, so it, it's, um, you know, not, you know, uh, you know, creating, you know, balance where, you know, the body can do its job, you know, with, uh, you know, with uh, detoxifying hormones, uh, mm -hmm. which it does. And if it's not in a proper state, then, then again, we now have excess of a hormone because the, you know, the body can't, uh, you know, detoxify that excess, uh, you know, hormonal balance. Mm, okay. 
So why do you think the body can't detoxify the excess hormone? And often I had a, a client who basically, again, uh, there's a improper liver function. So, I had a feeling you were going to say that. <laughs> I was like, so let's see it, if he says the liver. <laughs> exactly. You know, and it's, you know, cause I think we don't pay enough, enough attention to it. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm always interested when someone is in remission cause it's like, yeah, am I like a, a kid? You know, it's like, you know, what, what was it that was, you know, what do you think? And, you know, and talking to those who, you know, were at such a bad state and I'm like, you know, and they'll tell me, I just did a detox. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> no, you had to do something that was, you know, out of this world. You had to do this and all these crazy things you had to maybe do. And they said, no, I just did detox. And yeah. that I'm like, wow. And I hear that so often. And it's like, okay, that makes sense. You know, again, the, the body needs to detoxify certain things. It needs the liver is responsible for a lot of things. And when it's not you know, function properly, or it just has an overload of things of trying to do too much work. Um, but yeah, when you can see that someone is able to detoxify and, you know, if it's heavy metals and things like that, it's, um, you know, it's, and I'm like, I'm always blown away by that, but it's, you know, uh, yeah, when someone it's like, well, okay, <laughs> you know, so it's good to, you know, again, cause we do, we, as I mentioned, we're all predisposition in some sort of way, unless we live, you know, the, the mountains are organic farm and we're not, you know, we're not susceptible to anything, but we're not, you know, I mean, if it's the water we're drinking, the foods we're eating, whatever that may be, if it's in the air, uh, a pandemic, all of these things that we are basically now not resilient. So we have to make sure that we're resilient, but yeah, it's again, to assure that, you know, we are properly detoxifying. We're probably releasing what we should you know, to get rid of those things that are, uh, you know, detrimental for us, if not now, uh, in the long term. You know, I personally had, you know, things that I, you know, was, was challenged with as far as, you know, gut dysbiosis and things like that. And even though it may just be in the gut or it may just be something that is, you know, a little bit uncomfortable, that could also now lead to something downstream because now I can't detoxify. I can't mm -hmm. do the things that are necessary. So... Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how everything relates to everything, but that liver is, it's huge. And yeah. I love that you made the connection between the estrogen dominance and the, the liver not being able to get rid of the extra estrogen because it's toxic. Basically mm -hmm. it's, it's not able to uh, flush it out. So this is why detox. I mean, I talk about detox all the time. I, I know you follow me now too. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, but you know, a lot of people think, Oh, it's, let's just, do a cleanse and all, you know, that's it. But it's so much more than just um, some fad. It's, this is like necessary. <laughs> this yes. is life or death at this point. It's not really, oh, it's just something fun and I'm going to lose weight. And no, it's that if we don't detoxify all these 85,000 plus chemicals that have been dumped on us in the last hundred years and have been passed down in utero with, from mother to child and their child, et cetera, it's just the toxic soup bucket just gets uh, worse and worse. So, you know, you were, you, I use a cup analogy too. And I, by the way, I like that one too, that you're using, but I'll, I'll bring, this is my cup right now, but, <laughs> um, but basically the more that our liver and our, our body is overloaded with toxins, I mean, our, it just can't handle it anymore. There's a certain amount that it can handle and it's designed to deal with that toxic load. But after a while, it's just like, I can't, I just can't, I can't keep up with this anymore. And that's where everyone is at. None of us are exempt from that. I detox, he, you detox, right, Michael, and your wife yeah. detoxes, my husband yeah. detoxes. I mean, we're, we're all on this boat trying to keep ourselves balanced with what we're up against in, um, in society. So I love that term toxic soup. Absolutely. It is. We're all in a toxic soup yeah, exactly. <laughs> or toxic waste dump, mm -hmm. depending on where you live. Um, my, uh, I was in Las Vegas and mm -hmm. my husband kept saying, we're in a toxic waste dump. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, some places careful. that people live, they need to think about this even more. Like we all need to think Absolutely. about this, but depending mm -hmm. on where you live, it's even worse in certain areas too. So, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. No, for sure. Now, like, when mm -hmm. it comes to any type of cancer, um, you know, whether it's in the breast or the uterus, and ovary, et cetera, um, since we're talking about female health, um, fasting is a huge thing that people talk about in terms of even trying to shrink the tumor. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that 
people always have to fast if they're trying to shrink a tumor? Or do you think that maybe there's other things that if we just balance the chemistry in other ways, it's going to be vital? Where do you think yeah. fasting comes in? This? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Because uh, again, looking at each unique individual, uh, there have been times in working with clients that I have, you know, introduced a form of fasting to try to, you know, again, starve the, the tumor, starve the, you know, the cells. Uh, and you hear some good results. You hear some great results. Uh, I am definitely, I've seen some very positive feedback. Uh, I personally fast. Uh, you know, I have definitely suggested in a few clients that fast. I think, it, again, depending on each unique situation, if, uh, sometimes we're working with someone, depending on the stage they're at with their cancer, uh, if they're at a terminal state or some of the later stages, if they're not able, they're not taking taking it in. If the chemo has damaged the the gut, and they're not able to really ingest anything, I'm always looking to kind of maximize, minimize, and prioritize. So mm -hmm. um, for fasting, it's again depending on the key nutrients. It depends on where they're at. I try to meet them where they're at. So if they're at a stage where I need to get something back in, then I may look at a meal supplement or something to really get those key nutrients back in or if they're at an early stage or if they're you know they're at a, a good point you know where they're at then yeah we'll look at some some ways of fasting and, and they have some of the feedback i've been given are, are great you know uh you know that uh they're either uh their tumor is you know now not as aggressive or it's you know uh you know uh you know it's basically not you know not uh, progressing so but uh, yeah fasting you can definitely i believe and i i agree that uh you know sometimes we need that uh to really kind of starve those things out mm -hmm. that's kind of kind of the way i look at it but no fasting i i uh i've had some and i've seen positive feedback in it for sure mm -hmm. yeah. do you think it's possible to shrink a tumor without fasting uh i do I do. Uh, there's, you know, I've, I've uh, introduced, uh, you know, supplements such as curcumin. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen, uh, you know, even, you know, again, you hear so many things of curcumin, you know, uh, if, you know, but again, the form of the curcumin, but it's, you know, it, yeah, things such as that can really be, uh, you know, can shrink tumors. Uh, absolutely. It's something depending on their state. It's something I uh, I feel I, it's Kirk Kirkman's top of my top of my list for sure, uh, but uh, yeah, I do feel that Kirkman can in, in different things can definitely uh, shrink a tumor absolutely, mm -hmm. and you know, and again, it depends on where they're at because if that's going to put them at a worse state by shrinking that tumor, because again, it's I always mention it's if, if they have to live with cancer, I have clients that are living with tumors. Uh, and they're okay. So, uh, but I think, you know, if we kind of mess with those strings, we kind of, you know, we're, we're able to now just to get them stable, then I feel it's okay. But no, absolutely. You can definitely shrink, uh, shrink a tumor. So how much curcumin do you think people need to, obviously everything's kind of bio-individualized, yeah, but I'm just right. curious, like, yeah. where did how much do people really need? I mean, in general, I mean, is there, I know maybe one capsule versus a hundred is a huge right. difference, but I'm just thinking there's gotta yeah. be some kind of idea. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, if it's one, like you said, if it's one to two capsules daily, uh, I don't like to, you know, overwhelm the body. Uh, I think even, you know, I think we tend to go, Oh, if it's, if it's, you know, whatever, if it's cancer, I have to overwhelm, you know, it's kind of like more is better. I don't always feel more is better. I think it needs to be introduced slowly mm -hmm. uh, and introduced in a way that can, can basically can get you at a state to heal. You know, I feel the body can heal itself. So we have to want, you want to be at a state where allowing the body to heal uh, as opposed to overwhelming the body and creating other downstream issues, which, you know, for instance, as an example, if someone is, has kidney disease, you have to be careful with curcumin. So, um, you know, but again, looking at everything as opposed to, oh, just, you know, let's drink a whole bucket of curcumin, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and bye-bye tumors and bye-bye cancer. But I think it this, you know, uh, yeah, more is not always better. Uh, uh -huh. But yeah, so I feel a steady balance 
uh, I, you know, I'm always looking at balance it's, uh, as opposed to overwhelming. Uh, yeah. I think, and then the body can, it can heal. And I've had, you know, those clients who are in remission, uh, there was a lot of balance. There wasn't a lot of like, you know, I'm training for the Olympics or there wasn't a lot of excess of anything. There was a lot of balance. So if it was curcumin, if it was, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, if it was vitamin C, whatever that was, it was a lot of balance, you know, getting those key antioxidants in the body to be able to be resilient uh, as opposed to overwhelming the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's actually a good point. Um, I'm definitely a fan of increasing doses when the person's ready. But in the beginning, you know, you have to kind of find where that person is at because a little will go a long way on a good supplement and people will start to have a Herxheimer if they're not, their drainage pathways are not open and if they're, they're just not ready for it and then they can feel worse. And it's not to say that will never happen in this process, but if you go, if you start smaller, then you can get an idea of where you're at and how your body's reacting. And then you can go in more with the machine gun approach when the body's ready for it and then you know, sometimes that I think as well, it can be very beneficial depending on what you're trying to do with the supplements that you're using, exactly. but do not do that by yourself. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Cause that's one of the things you see. Yeah. They're like, Oh, okay. As soon as they get, you know, their supplement or they just want to, you know, overwhelm the body. It's like, no, 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 it's okay. So, you know, let's, uh, let's, you know, we don't, it's like you said, you know, uh, you know, those pathways, especially the, the detox pathways, you know, you've seen people just feel so much worse now, you know, because now there's like, oh no, we have, it's too, too fast. You know, the things we're getting into the cells, it's too, too much too soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you use binders with your practice too? Yes, absolutely. I feel that's, uh, I feel that's key. Exactly. I think binders are, are, uh, so essential for, again, the kind of, uh, you know, transportation process of key nutrients into the cells. So, uh, no, absolutely. You know, I think, uh, especially in someone who is a little overwhelmed and they're, you know, again, if that, depending on their stage of cancer, they may need, you know, again, more binders to get things to where they need to, to be. So what kind of binders mm -hmm. do you use? Uh, I, I mean, it's, it could be anything, uh, thorn, uh, the company Thorn, they, mm -hmm. they have a few key binders that are, you know, uh, that I've used um, also to some of the um, Designs Health as well. Um, but yeah, those are a few of the things that I've used. And even some of the just kind of natural solutions of, um, I'll look at things as far as uh, certain oils as well. Um, certain things, uh, you know, that I feel that, um, you know, if it's um, even things such as, uh, you know, uh, things that are kind of uh, detoxifying, such as broccoli and uh, Brussels sprouts as well, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. You know, so broccoli like, in terms of eating and yeah, a supplement, or are you talking about mm -hmm. um, and broccoli sprouts or broccoli? Uh, broccoli? <laughs> broccoli, but you know, I know not everyone loves it, but yeah, Brussels sprouts are, are hot. I know. love Brussels sprouts. Yeah, same here. So uh, I never knew that too for most of my life until I was probably yeah, in my 20s exactly. or so. My mom never fed me them. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. So uh, I, I, you know, because I, again, I think food is such a message as well, but you know, those kind of cruciferous, you know, mm -hmm. vegetables like cauliflower, uh, you know, uh, you know, again, broccoli and those things, they, they, they send some great messages to the body. So I try to introduce that. But again, if they're not able to really digest well, uh, or they're, you know, because again, that can also be sometimes hard on the thyroid, depending on the situation and each unique individual. Um, but yeah, I'll look at different, uh, different ways to, you know, be creative and uh, to find, you know, to open those pathways. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, one of the questions I want to ask you mm -hmm. about tumors, do you think, or even just cancer in general, um, do you think that the problem is the actual tumor or the fact that the tumor is blocking other things in the body? Um, you know, it's a good question. That's a great question, actually, because I don't always feel it's the actual tumor. Um, sometimes I feel it's the body trying to give a message. The body is trying to rebalance. And I think the tumor is there and trying to create balance. And I think sometimes, again, 
like a piano or something we kind of we want to like oh let's mess with the strings you know and everything's fine-tuned our bodies are extremely fine-tuned piano where you know we're uh you know we're well yeah we're amazing you know uh, people and i feel that you know it's like oh we have to disrupt we can't have a tumor but i think in certain situation that tumor may be necessary at that particular progression of their stage uh, and if it's living with a tumor, which I have clients who are living with tumors and they're doing great, they feel great. And as opposed to, you know, let's get rid of it. Let's, you know, you're, you're you know, those messages, you're, you're going to die. You're in a bad state, but yet they're in a really good state. So that's interesting as well is that they have a tumor and they're living with it and they're in a really good state and they're very healthy as opposed to now let's get rid of the tumor and, you know, so it's, it's kind of, it depends, you know, I, I'm not someone who feels, oh, we have, can't have a tumor. Absolutely not. I think at that particular time, there may be something that's affecting their body in some sort of way that's creating a tumor that where they, uh, you know, again, now we, you know, we mess with those piano strings. We want to cut it out. You know, we always, oh, let's get rid of it. And again, did it, did it, is it now going to spread? I've seen, I've had, I've, I've actually had personal cases where uh, they were doing okay, and then the tumor now spread. You know, the progression is now, you know, throughout in the, in the entire body. You know, months later after surgery. Um, so, it, you know, uh, those are the things as well that I think sometimes, um, depending on where they're at and as they progress and getting into a place of balance and place of healing, that tumor may be necessary depending on what's, you know, what's going on. So why do you think that it may be necessary? Um, because again, it's, you know, it's traumatic, I think, to the body in some sort of way. It's traumatic to where if now uh, we have surgery or we have some type of, some type of process that the, you know, that we're now feeding the cells, we're now feeding, you know, uh, certain, you know, uh, it was, you know, we're trying to create, the tumor's trying to create some sort of imbalance, you know, to, to heal. And we've now done something to, you know, to not create balance, but to create even more imbalance, and depending on the person, I feel that that can happen uh, in certain cases where we can create more imbalance by now, you know, uh, getting rid of the tumor, especially with it's some type of surgical removal, um, you know, of the tumor that it now, you know, that we now, where that it was, where that was the tumor trying to, was the body's, was that the body's way of trying to hold and balance in place mm. and to not be able to spread. And now have we now allow that tumor to spread. So I, I feel that the body's, you know, is, is resilient in that way that maybe it was creating some type of, you know, keeping us you know it's like a dam that breaks you know and okay uh, so so mm -hmm. in the tumor what's in the tumor i'm sure people that are listening at this point might right. think be thinking that right so if the tumor is cancerous and it has you know uh cancerous cells it doesn't want to now spread to mm -hmm. our uh healthy cells mm -hmm. um you know does it want it to attack the healthy cells so was that tumor there and protecting the healthy cells. So that's, mm. you know, from a cellular point of view, which I always look at is that's always my fear is, you know, because I always talk to people again about the best, making the best judgment for their treatment. And they often will say, you know, well, I, you know, I, I really think that this is best. And, you know, again, it could be where that was what they needed, you know, they needed, uh, you know, to, and it helped them heal. But there's been situations that I've had a few clients where after treatment, the, uh, those, those cancer cells spread to their healthy cells. So okay. Now, you know, so the, there's cancer cells inside the tumor. And then if someone cuts the tumor, now the cancer cells might spread through to other areas in the body. Right. And so that's usually my fear. And that's what I look at is, you know, those unhealthy, those cancerous cells now, you know, because that's what it is. It's, uh, you know, it's a n number of, you know, uh, different imbalances I feel that are in cancer uh, as opposed to just one disease. And I feel that it's a number of things that are in those cancer cells that are looking to spread. Okay. 
So do you use systemic enzymes? Um, no, not, uh, I can't say that I do. Um, again, uh, I will use in certain cases uh, because I'm always looking at the gut. So mm -hmm. if it's a certain case, yeah, absolutely. I think I will uh, introduce in some sort of way. I try not to create too much, um, but yeah, absolutely. I, think, I feel it's important for those key enzymes to kind of do their, you know, do their job, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mm -hmm. was the enzyme queen before, um, <laughs> before right. I came to Cellcor actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that I'm opposed to, to enzymes, but I, you know, studying from Hippocrates mm -hmm. and it was just enzyme everything. And then I did yeah. live blood analysis and anyone that studies live blood analysis usually is introduced to a ton of enzymes as well too, it seems like. And then I started learning more about what they're doing. And it was more of like, let's remove the root. Let's remove the pathogens. Let's remove the toxins. Um, and in that, then your body will make more of its natural um, enzymes itself. So I got to a point where I'm not even really using it. Like I would always have enzymes with my food, <laughs> for example. Mm -hmm. And then systemic enzymes are what you would take away from food. But it's really common in, in a lot of different cancer treatments that like even if you watch um, those cancer documentaries, um, what are those ones called? I don't know. There's a lot of popular yeah, there's, cancer yeah. documentaries now that they think about it. But a lot of times they talk about systemic enzymes. So mm -hmm. some of them will talk about how they'll use, I don't know, 150 enzymes, systemic enzymes a day to help shrink this tumor. Um, you know, if I was in that situation, maybe I might think different, but it's amazing that I, I mean, I personally don't even feel like I need an enzyme with my food anymore. Like, versus before I felt like I couldn't digest my food at all you know what I was dealing with all kinds of different stuff inside my gut so our body should be able to produce a lot of its own enzymes that it needs to help um, to really heal the body but if we are overloaded with our toxins and parasites and fungus etc mold you mentioned that too is a huge one I need to have someone on the, this uh, podcast talk about mold because that's a that's yeah, a big exactly <laughs> There's definitely more a conversation about mold. And like, you know, like you said, Dr. Eckling is, is, um, is again, you know, like our, 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 our favorite, um, you know, Brussels sprouts and things like that, because, you know, yeah, you could now be exacerbating the, the, the issue uh, with, you know, depending on too much of the enzymes. And, you know, I think some of the more natural approach, uh, you know, it, you know, guess, like you said, it depends on the situation and that, the person they may need that but um, I tend to not uh, you know feel I have to just introduce that I'll look at you know different ways to you know to allow the body to be able to heal itself and to get the gut right yeah 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 so getting the the body to flow right so for example we don't even really use um, glutathione uh, we actually, um, we, we use certain things that have broccoli sprouts and blueberry extract and wheatgrass and all that, that turns on the pathway so that that glutathione is um, flowing throughout the body, which is an interesting concept because it's, there's a lot Our of glutathione word. that's used, huh? <laughs> Our favorite word, glutathione. glutathione. right. I mean, that's a huge <laughs> antioxidant that's yeah. detoxifying the body and um, cleaning up this free radical damage that's causing the cancer, right? Um, so it's, uh, you know, the question really is at the end of the day for whatever practitioner someone's working with is um, how do we optimize the body and how do we, how do we make sure that the pathways are open? How do we make sure that they're properly detoxifying, et cetera? Um, it, it can be, I know even with functional medicine, we could start to do all these labs and there's like, oh my God, there's all these deficiencies and there's all these, there's all like a million things. And then where do you even start? Um, so, but you know, at the end of the day, how do we get the body optimi optimally functioning and having those certain pathways like mm -hmm. the, um, the NERF2 pathway flowing correctly so that we can have enough glutathione production? Mm -hmm. How do we uh, clean up the gut so that we have enough enzyme production, et cetera? Because these are so important if the body's gonna function optimally and deal with something like a tumor. Yeah, it's funny that, you know, I think, for most of us that are doing this work and especially functional medicine it's it's funny how glutathione is <laughs> becomes like our you know and it's true i love it's like yeah when i first heard the word i'm like what is that what is glutathione? <laughs> but now it's like i talk about it all the time because it's so essential to the body you know one of the things i learned in my practice is you know i figured oh no it's about eating some more salads about eating this and it's sometimes the simplest things of 
you know, really the production of glutathione and production of that of resiliency, as I mentioned, as you mentioned as well. Um, it's, you know, water, like your, you know, our cups, <laughs> you know, I really have seen in so many cases, it's just people do not hydrate. People do not mm -hmm. do these things that are really the body needs to for proper, uh, you know, antioxidant function and you know, opening those pathways. Um, you know, one of the things you see so often, I try to do this in my morning, you know, my morning uh, radical self-care, uh, daily self-care is just some simple movement. You don't have to mm -hmm. train for the Olympics. It doesn't <laughs> have to be, you know, your next uh, tryout for, you know, a professional sports team or anything. Literally just simple movement. If it's yoga, if it's Tai Chi, simple movement. If it's a walk, um, you know, just getting the those things, you know, you see so often, mm -hmm. you know, in one of the things I really focus, especially in cancer patients, is that they deal with a lot of muscle loss, uh, a lot of bone, you know, those type of things that are important for glutathione production. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, but, you know, really getting those things back in to their body to be able to, again, have some form of, uh, you know, of uh, movement and, you know, muscle production and things like that. It doesn't have to be major, but those things I've seen, uh, in so many ways, there are just the simplest lifestyle medicine, as I like to call it. But, uh, you know, but it's true. And again, even the messages are so important. So the messages that we're sending ourselves, you know, if it's a negative message or if it's a positive message, and I've seen this, those who are just really positive about their uh, state of being at that particular moment, they, you know, again, they, you know, you know, their remission, they have, you know, really, uh, you know, overcome cancer, but yet they showed up, you know, with, uh, you know, no hair and, uh, you know, uh, you know, surgeries. And they're at that moment, they're in a really bad state, but yet you would never know that. You would never know mm -hmm. that they're missing body parts and that, you know, they're in a really bad state, but yet, you know, they just are sending positive message. And now, they're still alive and they're still, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're in such great spirit. So again, those messages are so important, but I, uh, I can't agree yeah. enough. And I have a friend actually, I just remembered as we were speaking that mm -hmm. she did have breast cancer and she got her breast removed and her hair fell out and mm -hmm. throughout the whole time she was just continuing to praise, praise Jesus. And, yeah. and her spirit is just like still radiated. I know she got mm -hmm. depressed at times and you know, it's, you, you can't, any normal human is going to have their, their emotions with it. But in general, I mean, the way she handled it emotionally, I, looking in from the outside, I was, I'm impressed. She's still around today and she's gone through so much with that. Um, so it's, it, it really, I, I can't stress enough to people. I think sometimes we undermine, like you said, the little things that make a huge difference and, and how mindset is, it's just so key. So yeah. Michael, you know, I'm so grateful for your wisdom and, um, you know, your sensitivity to this subject. Um, I could, I could feel that. And, um, I know that you really care about your clients and, and new people that you come across. And, um, you know, we're all very grateful that you came on the show today. I'm sure people that are listening today, some people, um, you know, really wanted to hear this message. So anyways, um, go, why don't you go ahead and tell the listeners where they can find you? Sure. No, and thank you, Dr. Jacqueline. It's um, it's definitely in the work that you're doing, and it's an honor to be here and to, you know, to be able to share this message and to be able to connect to this message. So, so thank you for uh, for having me. But yes, you can reach me at uh, health as meant to be. Uh, it's basically health then as meant m e a n t and then the number two and b is boy dot com. Okay, perfect. And then you also have an Instagram and a Facebook too, right? Yes, uh, you can also, uh, from the website, you can also find me Facebook, which is also Health is Meant to Be, and then and Instagram at um, Born Health Tracky. Kind of, okay, uh, perfect. Yeah. The tracky part's a little bit about my personal side of uh, my, my, like to say, my nerdy side. <laughs> you're, a, you're a Cherokee? Yeah, I'm a tracky for sure. So. Oh, tracky, tracky, tracky like yeah. you like to run. The, no, Star Trek. <laughs> oh, Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife gives me a hard time about that because she's, yeah, it's funny. That's one of the things that, you know, for me, it's, I think it's also relates to the work that we do. Uh -huh. I'm a little bit nerd, nerd at heart. 
So, uh, you know, uh, those things, but yeah. So I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all have our things. And, uh, I, I, you know, I could definitely see you being into Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, let me write that one down. So I, you know, what I realized that you're not my, I'm not following you on Instagram and I want to put that in the show notes as well too. So yeah, no, absolutely. That would be great. What is it again? The oh, uh, born health. Tracky, T R E K K I E, born health tracky. Okay, perfect. All right, Michael. Well, thanks again for joining us and um, you know providing this abundant knowledge and giving hope to people that really need it. So, any last words for the listeners? No, I, I again I appreciate uh, everyone, and again I, I deeply connect to this this work, and uh, so it's an honor to you know to be able to connect with everyone. All right. Thank you listeners again for joining. I hope that you got something amazing from this. And if anything that you do have hope, because that is why we do this. So take care, have a blessed week, and we will return again next week. Thank you for listening to the Wellness Trinity podcast. Be sure to subscribe for more wellness tips to help you achieve optimal health. Don't forget to rate and review so we can continue to bring you the best content. See you on the next episode.